another really powerful way is to encourage them to make take ownership of their own story that, w- that they wished they'd had instead of perhaps the more toxic one you know and i think that's another really important and very powerful uh therapeutic approach which is called never narrative therapy which we could call storytelling and encourage them to take ownership of a new story yeah but of course then they'll have to let go of the other one and that often is the difficult part that's the inner child work yeah yeah we demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations this is the therapy show behind closed doors podcast with bob cook and jackie jones welcome back to the next episode of the therapy show behind closed doors with the fabulous and delightful mr bob cook (laughs) i'm not saying wonderful this week um and what we're going to be doing in this episode episode 69 is how to work with the inner child in the therapy room which we do a lot of really yeah <laughs> i was thinking of the words Exqu- exquisite is another word i feel quite delicious today i had oh, yeah. a uh, palate <laughs> i had a pilates session this morning so i feel sort of quite free relaxed uh I like, yeah, but delicious is a nice word. I like delicious. Delicious is a good word. Yeah, yeah. So I've been doing that and I've been teaching uh, students supervision, how to do supervision, a supervision certificate. So I've had a good day. Cool. Now getting to the subject, yeah. Why I picked this one is that you, you're correct. I think most people listening will probably know what is meant by working with the inner child. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily come from transactionalism where you talk about working with the child ego state. People know about what is meant working with the inner child. Um, just in case they don't, it means working with the younger self. Yeah. In other words, working in a developmental way. So um, if you're a transactionalist, you would think about uh, the child ego state so when you think of the inner child, you think about working in TA, you think about working with the child. But the next question, of course, the developmental question is, how old is the, you know, the, the ego state you're going to visit? But generally, working with the inner child means working developmentally with the younger self. Yeah. So is we're going backwards. We're looking in the past when we're doing yeah, Is that how you see it? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And of course, when people say working with the inner child, um, I don't often then go and talk about what age. No. But the reality, of course, is that if we're going to work with the past, we can work with the child in many different ages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so three, six, nine, whatever age we're going to regress to in the process. I mean, the client's going to go regress to. Um, so even you, though people use that generic term in, in working with the inner child, I think more specifically, it's interesting to ask what age we're talking about. Yeah. And usually in my professional experience, it's linked to the trauma. So what age developmentally is the deficit or the trauma that we're talking about? And that's usually where we end up going to. Yeah. And the client will give you clues in the body language as well, I would imagine, as to how young they actually are. Say a little bit more, I agree with you. Um, Just, you know, I've had clients when we've been doing in-depth work where they, they kind of lift the feet up and they're curled up in a ball on the edge of the chair. And mm. yeah, I don't want to say the fetal position, but you can tell that they're quite young by, yeah, even the tone of voice that they use, it might go high-pitched. Mm. So with those clues, I mean, you can ask them what their age are, but of course, if it's non-verbal, you won't get much of a response. But yeah. um, the younger they are, does that then determine the transactions that you use, for example? Yeah. Yeah. I think my intention would be, I know we touched on this on the previous podcast about having a low, calm voice. And, you know, I might... 
I want to say lean forward into them a bit more with a more nurturing approach. Yeah. And I would imagine that the younger the developmental work with the child that you're dealing with, the sentence constructions will become shorter. Yeah. And more based at the age that you're aiming to work with yeah. the tone of the child. And again, often, you know, d dependent on where where the client is, a lot of the time, they do go quiet. They don't know, you know, if, if you're firing questions at them, they they shrug their shoulders and, like you said, maybe being non-verbal or they don't know what the answer is. You know, I can I can see that you, you're visibly upset, what's upset you, and they don't necessarily know what that is. Mm. That's absolutely correct. And there's lots of feelings. I just feel mm. this way. Yeah. So if you're working with the inner child, whatever developmental age we're talking about, um, there needs to be methodology of how to get there. Mm. Yeah. Um, language we might use is regression, but we need to ha have some methods or methodology on how to get to the inner child. We can work out what we're gonna do when we get there, but we need to talk about how we get there in the first place. Yeah. So if you're thinking about working developmentally within your child and going to the traumatic places we talk about, do you have any particular techniques that you use or any particular ways that you think about methodologically in terms of how to get the client to go to those places? Other than like, like, you know, using my voice and lowering the tone and things like that, often this happens naturally without me consciously mm. attempting to regress. Mm. Yeah. The more disturbed a person is, the more we, uh, the more spontaneous regression there is. Yeah. And that's because they don't have such access to um, a healthy or robust adult. Mm. You know, they're, grasp on adult is more fragile so they're more likely to um, have a spontaneous regression yeah i think there are other things as well as what you're saying uh, uh, so i'll give a list of them i think um, one of them is through relaxation techniques now you might want to call that hypnotic induction either way um, helping the um client relax uh, helping them actually um, through breathing exercises uh, uh, music's another way to help people relax but helping a person to relax is really important when you start doing this work because if they are not relaxed uh, they're going to be more defensive and um, this type of work is going to be harder yeah so I think relax, relaxation is really important. Um, secondly, another technique a lot of people would use, by the way, is what I would call guided fantasy. Other people might call it imagery work. Um, other people might just say fantasy work. But these other, another word might be used to some, means the same thing, visualizations. Now, I know you do a lot of this, don't you, visualizations and I have done in the past. I think the way that I use, you know, visualizations, if anything, is, you know, in conversation, if they're talking about when they were younger, is to get them to picture their younger self. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then what will you do? Um, it depends how the client reacts to that. But I'll kind of then rather than leave them there if, if they're feeling uncomfortable or in an overwhelmed state, then maybe talk about what would you now want to say to the child at that age and yeah, kind of yeah. half in the present and half in the past, if that makes sense. Yeah, so there's lots of visualisations around. So, for example, you could say, OK, we're going to we need to go back and look at um, the, the trauma or or whatever we're talking about in terms of deficits. So just imagine, for example, um, that part of yourself which is hurting and you know has pain. And just imagine her or him 
And let's go back a little bit. Now, as you sort of imagine him and her, I'd like you to just put a, perhaps a, that part of you in a safe place. Yeah. To find a particular safe place. And just tell me where that safe place is. You could have the safe place in this room or maybe a safe place somewhere else, but tell me where you put that part of yourself that hurts so much. And then they're going to tell you. And that's yeah. what I mean by visualizations or yeah. imagery work. It's a way of taking the client back in a safe way. So they are in charge of the process. Yeah. They take that part of the self back to a safe place, wherever that is. And then as they take themselves back there, you can say, oh, now, where are you? Tell me a bit about it. And they might say, though, I don't know, a place which they've been happy in their history or a safe container anyway, always safe place in the room. And now tell me a little bit more about where the hurt is. So you're going back gently in a, and you're helping them take ownership of a safe place in the process. You're not just, um, I think it's really important to have them going back to a safe place or a place which is really positive for them. Yeah, because often when they do go back, it is to the trauma and it is to the event. And, mm. you know, like you said, the hurt and the pain and, and the scare that, that was involved with that. Yeah. I like to take them back to a safe place. And when they're in that safe place, they're often younger by, them, by yeah. the way now, developmentally, because they've started to relax, started to find a safe place, started to take that part of themselves which needs healing or hurt back to a different age. Yeah. And then you can say, now, how, what, what would you say to that part of you that's hurting so much? Or what's happening at the moment when you think about that part of you that's been hurt? So you're taking them back through imagery or visualization. Another way is to get them to visualize uh, someone who's quite powerful, somebody who they want on their side and or an ally or even yourself as the therapist and get them to go back in time um, to meet, if it was abuse, you know, dealing with abusers, you know, and you could get the therapist to yeah. uh, talk instead of you, instead of the client, sorry, the younger self, to the user. So, you know, visualisation work, imagery work, they're all important ways to help the client go back. Another, I think, really powerful way, by the way, is art, what I would call art therapy. Yeah. And often when you do art therapy, by the way, one tip is to ask the person, to do the imagery or whatever we're going to talk about here with their non-dominant hand. Oh, that's the region. I've not heard that before. Yeah. So I'm right-handed, right strongly. Yeah. So I then would encourage the person to do it with the left hand. Now, so things happen once you start doing that. Often it takes the person back to the struggles they had anyway. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, and there's quite a lot of books books written about art therapy with the non-dominant hand and how that aids regression. Yeah. Um, but art therapy, I think, is a, a very safe and positive way to work with the inner child through symbolism, through, you know, all, all those fragmented selves as they might write down on paper, for example, I, I like that way, and it's a good technique into regression. Yeah. I've seen art therapy done and witnessed it where somebody was asked to, to draw themselves on the page and how big they see themselves. Mm. And it was interesting that it was really small and just in the bottom corner yeah. and yeah. things like that, yeah. And then what you might do is say, okay, so that's really interesting here. How about you talk to your bigger self? Or yeah. You know, you, you can take it further. Yeah. And that will, that's what we would call it here, you and me would call it inner child work. Yeah. It's very powerful. Yeah. 
And, you know, it, it's, I suppose, you know, getting them to draw themselves and, you know, talk about how they feel being that size and, and you know, that position on the page and the colours and, and all those sorts of things. There is so much that you can get from, from art, however it, it's done. But I've not heard it about it being done with a non-dominant hand before. Yeah, and there's quite a few books written about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm, because, because again, it kind of takes the pressure off when somebody's drawing things, or it, again, it's a safe space, really. Hmm. Yeah. And if you do the non dominant hand straight straight away, they are uh, how can I? You will get in touch quicker with their vulnerable self. Yeah. As I said, I was earlier on in this podcast. I was doing Pilates this morning. And I'm very dominantly right-handed, uh, and so uh, and all the way through the through through my own body. And um, by doing some work or looking at, you know, stretches with the right and the left, and I, and I felt more. I mean, it isn't about regressing with your new Pilates, but I could feel more vulnerable with the left side because it wasn't so much in charge. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that goes for a lot of us, that one side is more dominant than the other, and it's not just left or right-handed, like you said. It's it's literally mm. down the whole body, yeah. So if you can get in touch with the vulnerable self, that will lead to the younger self, and then you can in encourage the person to, you know, not just talk about the trauma, but basically maybe talk to the different parts of the self. Yeah. Part of it with me when when a client has regressed is to encourage them to be compassionate and show self love yeah, to that absolutely. part of themselves because often yeah. there's a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and you know responsibility and could I have done it different and all those sort of things. Yeah, and I think one of the really most powerful techniques when you work with the inner child is to help the younger self have a different narrative yeah um which is more positive yeah rather than what it often is is the negative narrative of the parent which they've taken on as their own which actually yeah. is theirs yeah totally yeah so that that for me is a big part of any work that i do is is talking about self-love and compassion and visualizing that younger self and what what mm. maybe they needed then that they didn't get See, that's all in the child work. Yeah. So you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. Another sort of technique or way of helping us get to the inner child is through what is often called narrative therapy, which is really storytelling. Yeah. And through stories, you can really often get um, to the younger developmental part of the child. And, you know, there's lots of storytelling, not only, you know, telling stories, but another really powerful way is to encourage them to make, take ownership of their own story that, w that they wished they'd had instead of perhaps the more toxic one, you know. And I think that's another really important and very powerful uh, therapeutic approach, which is called never narrative therapy which we could call storytelling and encourage them to take ownership of a new story yeah but of course then they'll have to let go of the other one and that often is the difficult part that's the inner child work yeah yeah mm. yeah so because we all we all have our own narrative and we all have our own story about how things were and it does it it, it kind of seeps into our subconscious and it does become part of us Absolutely. And often with narrative therapy, you can get to their birth story. Yeah. And what they think of their name. And out of 10 to 1, Jackie, you know, if you go down that path, you will find amazing, uh, it's very powerful, amazing emotions about, you know, people's imagery of their own um, name and what that means and yeah. their birth stories and their birth myths and all that's in a child work 
because you know they are powerful the stories that we have around our birth oh very 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 much yeah it it lays the foundation for going forward <laughs> yeah and many people have been adopted who've been fostered who had attachment ruptures uh, who have toxic histories they have such rich stories about their own name yeah what it means for them yeah and that's real in a child work. Yeah. Because often when you, you talk into a client and say, you know, are there any stories around your birth? You, you know, their initial reaction is, no, not really. <laughs> but then the more you talk about it and the more you discuss it, it's yeah. kind of like, oh, I remember that being spoken about or I remember that being said about, mm. you know, when I was born and how I was born yeah. and what was going on at the time that I was born and things. Right. yeah all that and you know you know that's funny you said that because I was given the name Albert you know and that was after my grandfather who was the black sheep of the family and yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you know that's that's just, and you get the whole story of why they've lived up to their grandfather's yeah you know script of being the black sheep for example yeah. Well, I never really wanted that name. I wanted, you know, we could go on and on about the stories, but that's real in the child work, I think. Yeah. And it is really interesting because it's it's like peeling back the layers, you know, from initially, no, I don't think there was any stories, mm. to suddenly unfolding this whole narrative that they'd carried around for, for an awful long time. And they live up to it. Yeah, yeah. Often called script theory in TA. Yeah. I've got, I've got a birth story, and it, it is still with me now. It, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. So it's really important. Uh, another sort of really important, I think, therapy that uh, can be used to get back to the the inner work we're talking about here is music therapy. Music therapy is so powerful, it's so evoked. So that's evoked. not something I've ever used or no. seen used. No. Oh well. That would be something like, oh, pick a, pick a, you say to the clients, you know, pick up a, 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 a sense of music or, you know, uh, uh, a tune or that really would, that you really like, that's really important for you. And, you know, we'll play that and often it's so evocative. Yeah, because music does transport you back to an earlier time or, you know, yeah. a memory or, yeah. you know, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I remember I saying to this person, what's your sort of really a song that you think a lot about? And um, she said, oh, Release Me by Ingelbert Humperdinck, which is a long, long time ago. Yeah. I said, well, oh, that's an interesting song he said oh yes i i played it a lot in my history because i wanted somebody to release me from this hell wow and from that i found the music by the way it's a old 1963 or something uh, I, I know it very well it was played oh. in my house <laughs> and we played that and it was so evocative and you know it, it, what i'm saying is that it's a really Another important style of therapy that you can use to get back to this, these often very ev evocative yeah. memories or scripts that clients hold and take round with themselves, which aren't healthy. Yeah, and it's interesting when you're talking about music and, you know, the, the narrative and everything, is it, is it always ones that we choose or are there things that are kind of put onto us? that we well, then yeah. carry around. That's right, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that we may take on, which has nothing, has, may define us, but actually has nothing to do with us. Yeah, yeah. Because I can remember a lot of my, the music that I remember from my childhood wasn't my music, it was music that my mum and dad played. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That kind of, yeah, there are memories attached to it. Mm. You're right. Music can transport you to another place altogether. Yeah. Many, my, many, many years ago. Yeah. Such a evocative medium. 
And I suppose using any of the senses kind of gets you out of your logical mind. It bypasses a lot of yeah. the barriers yeah. when we use our senses. Yeah. Bypass yeah. cognition quite often. Yeah. So for people who are very in their head or in intellectualize a lot, yeah. more creative um, techniques or mediums you can find, like art therapy, music therapy, narrative therapy, all these things. Yeah will help the person move to their child, uh, their inner child, and you can do the inner child work from that. Yeah. Now, I think it all needs to be contracted for, by the way. This, I don't think this is something you impose on something. Yeah. It won't be contracted for, but, you know, the trauma, the deficits, the healing isn't in the present, it's in the past. So, you know, that's where we need to have, and that head, and all these techniques are very useful to think about in terms of working with the inner child. Yeah. Another another sort of real medium is often what is called sculpturing. Ever heard of that? You might not have done. But no, but I was thinking as you were saying that one of the things that I did with a client that was kind of stuck and we were on the verge of something but not was using Play-Doh. Yeah, that's a really important one. Play dough, sand therapy. Yeah, just something that they could play with and mold into something while we were talking that kind of took the pressure off them to a certain extent. So when you said sculpture, I didn't know whether that was what you were meaning. Is no, I wasn't, but that's sculpting. really important. <laughs> you took you to now, of course, sand therapy is uh eons uh history in terms of you know um a mechanism to help people um, get back to their younger child and is used so much. And so much actually, I'm not sure if it does come from the Jungian world, but a lot of Jungian therapists will use sand therapy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by sand therapy? Not a clue, no. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I have to write re listeners down either way. But that would be, uh, if, if you went to a therapist that's used sand therapy to help you get to the inner child, for example, they would have a, um, a platform or uh, a, a maybe sand and on, in the sand would be objects. And they'd be loads of say 50 or 60 objects. It might be marbles, it could be toy soldiers, it could be frogs, it could be, you know, I, I enjoy bargain hunt and there's a, I often smile when there's all these toys from history. But anything that would be evocative to a person's childhood would go in the sand tray. Okay. So the tray might be, we've got cats here and they're litter, <laughs> about <laughs> the size of a litter uh, uh, tray, if you like. Well, it could be bigger, but <laughs> we'll have all sorts of glittering objects there, which would be very evocative to the child. So I remember the last time I did some sand tray therapy, which was all about going back to my child, there were all sorts of miniature models and sort of shining objects and marbles and all sorts of things, model birds and there was trinkets and there was uh, objects reminded me of the sun and there was flags and there were all sorts of things. And um, she said, just range, 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 uh, let's make a, Let's make a imagery out of this in your your own way. Just pick some objects which really appeal to you. Yeah. Make any imagery that you want. Now, have you ever done this? No. Okay. Well, this is very evocative because straight away, well, I did anyway, and this is the you start, you're attracted to the objects that often you play so much within your child or actually appeal to those um, ages of your history. And then you, you make this whole model, what might take you half an hour, if you like, and see into your patterns. And then with the therapist, you start analyzing these things. And where does this come from? What does that remind you of? And how come all this sorts of, and that takes you straight back to your child. Yeah. And then you would start doing the work from that. Which I would imagine is quite powerful. 
extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. No, I've never yeah. heard of that. That's interesting. You often come from Jungian archetypes, the idea of... So it's... Uh, people who do some... Yeah, some play listening to this podcast. I don't want to do a disservice of that because I haven't been trained in that yeah. type of therapy. It was just a technique that a therapist used with me that I found very useful and have used myself with clients. Yeah. So I know how powerful it is. So you've got narrative therapy, you've got art therapy, you've got music therapy, you've got sound play therapy, you've got narrative therapy, you've got storytelling, you've got all these evocative ways to bypass the intellectual cognitive yeah. people who get stuck in their own brains yeah and i think that's the key is it does bypass it when we're when we're moving when we're using our hands or doing something creative it does bypass that that yeah. barrier that, that people put up where the the thinking about things yeah. too much yeah definitely and you know there's a, there's a whole ream of things i'm an ex-foster carer and you know with some of the foster children that we had they would go to play therapy once a week where yeah. somebody was trained and you know it was literally like a, an aladdin's cave in the room you know where the children could pick what they wanted and they'd be talking while they're drawing or painting or playing in water or whatever it was yeah so that is inner child work yeah it's good healing stuff the, healing the trauma of a person's history so, so the therapy you, room should have lots of things in it to use but you like you said it needs to be contracted yeah. the client needs yeah. some if room you're to doing it, a child yeah. work yes yeah so the people that you know you said you were a foster parent and you were just describing the play therapy and the therapist at work contractually with that of course and uh, you know all people who've been fostered have attachment ruptures and yeah. they often have uh, quite traumatic histories because of the abandonment and the, the stories they tell themselves and lots of other things to do with their birth. So what you described to me there was really evocative. I can just imagine going to, you know, what you just described and playing with my, playing with a fort or doing a, a drawing or doing some energy work or, doing some work with the Play-Doh. And then the, the, then the therapist will, will then do developmental work with the inner child to help yeah. the child heal the deficits that has been brought up through the work that's been done. I think that's the bit that I always liked. We, we were quite lucky with this one particular child that I was thinking about. I think he'd only been with us for six months when I had my youngest son. And he was with us for like nine years. He was, so my son was nine when he eventually left. But it was like he was reparented by doing things that I was doing with my younger son. You know, yeah. we, he would sit on the bed when we were reading bedtime stories. And if yeah. my little boy was finger painting, then he would always join in and do things. But it was a very natural state for him to be in rather than being the focus of the attention. And, you know, when children or, or adults are allowed to go back and fill in those gaps, that's really powerful. One, it's wonderful. Yeah. And you mentioned something there, which is really, really important within the child work. And that is that when you do, when you're doing any child work or working developmentally with the child, what often will come up, of course, is the parent. Yeah eager state you know in other words through their play they will you know bring up whether it's through art story music whatever we want to talk about often the negative parent yeah or the, the person inner dialogue yeah. yeah the person responsible for the trauma or 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 the ogre yeah and then it's up to the therapist to be able to help, if possible, the child dialogue or express what's it all about. And then the therapist needs to offer the protection mm. to be able to help the child, you know, the protection against the ogre, for yeah. example, or whatever it is, to help the child heal. Yeah. 
And I think that's a really important thing, going back to what you you were saying at the very beginning, was, you know, it being a safe space. Oh, you can't do this work yeah. if you don't have a safe place. Um, and, you know, it sounded wonderful, that sort of environment that you were talking about with your foster children and the play therapy. That, um, it sounded wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it did, it, it helped. But, you, you know, you, you speak to somebody on the street who doesn't really or hasn't had a, an insight into how it works. They think, well, so what are they getting from it if they're just playing? But it is, they get so much mm. from it. And, you know, part of the thing with this particular child was having a free choice what he could do. Absolutely. It wasn't laid out that this is what we're going to, we're going to play with the fort this week or whatever, mm. you know, and the cars he would always pick the emergency service police cars or ambulance cars yeah, which was yeah. a bit of an insight into mm. some of the things that happened in his past but giving a child or, or giving an adult in regression carte blanche to to do what they want is is powerful yeah and it's almost magical yeah 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 to have no no boundaries or no limits to to what you're doing because exactly. in life we often don't get that opportunity yeah and you can also do what i would call spot in it in a child work so if you're working with your client in the here and now you might do work where as i say through visualization or through hypnotic induction or all, many of the things we talk about here where you may do some inner child work within the within one hour yeah it doesn't have to be the you know what we've just been talking about there which is this environment set up for the child to uh spend two three hours uh that, that's a different sort of a system but a lot of the work that i did within hour within hour um really was through again visualizations imagery helping them talk to the ogres or the toxic parents or the abusers in a very safe protective way yeah. so there'll be some really really important healing going on and then they can make they can take ownership of a new they can take ownership of a new future a much more healthy future instead yeah. of the one they've carried around with them yeah I really enjoyed this one, Bob. Great. There's just a couple of books, which I think what all about inner child work and a really great book. It's a very old, it's probably about 20. I could give lots of books, but I'm going to go to two quite old books, but you very well-known books, I think. One is called Homecoming by John Bradshaw. Have you heard that? No. He was a TA therapist. <laughs> well, they all seem to be TA those people. Um, and I think he, I'm not sure if he was American, but he, won, he wrote this wonderful book called Homecoming, which is really about coming home. And in that, he talks a lot about how you work with the inner child and a lot of um, techniques. And it's just a wonderfully accessible book about how a therapist works and helps the client regress and go to places where they need such positive healing. It's called Homecoming by John Bradshaw. I think it must be 20 years old. Yeah. And he wrote another book and I was thinking, well, what's that called? And I can't remember, but they're both by John Bradshaw. But the, most, the book I liked the most was called Homecoming, which has a lot of techniques in it, but there's such wonderful descriptions of the healing work that he did in the in the inner child domain we're talking about here. Well, thank you for that, Bob. Mm. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to talk about all these um, therapies and techniques that uh, we can use to get to help our clients have a different type of future. Yeah and to let go of the traumas and toxicity that they carry around and define themselves by um, so often.
Very powerful stuff, Bob. So until next time, when we will be looking at what is transformational in the therapy process. Well, there's so much, uh, what we're talking about here is really transformation. I was thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll talk a lot more than in the chart, but if you're going to do inner child work, it's all about transformation. Yeah. Of course, what I also need to talk about is um, how we tackle the parent in the service of transformational work. That's interesting. Mm. So until next time, Bob. Okay. I could, I, I could talk forever, so I'm glad you've stopped me. <laughs> Save it for the next episode. Come on. <laughs> Speak soon. Mm. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.